flying llamas, all sorts of evil and mysterious and enlightened existences behind the ring of mountains that encircles this mysterious land called Tibet. And so we thought, what is it about this hidden land, this occult land, that has fascinated the West uh, so greatly? So last week we explored uh, Helena Blavatsky's envisioning of what Tibet could represent for us all. And on Wednesday, the 1st of February, at lunchtime, we'll be looking at the Nazi expedition to Tibet, conducted by the anthropologist Schaefer uh, under the auspices of Heinrich Himmler's outfit to find the Aryan, the lost Aryan races um, that purportedly uh, came to rest after the submersion of Atlantis somehow on the highest point of Earth. Uh, we will discover that. But tonight, um, we're going to look at early Soviet interest in Tibetan Buddhism and what it could do for the communist revolution. And it's a fascinating, multifaceted tale. And uh, Andrei Zamensky is the person to talk about it because he's made this his specialty, esotericism in uh, Russia and the East. He um, has taught in a number of places, uh, the University of Hokkaido in Japan, for example, and the University of Memphis and Alabama State University. And now he's here in New York City after an absence um, of a number of decades to bring the story of Red Shambhala to us all tonight here at the Rubin Museum of Art. So Andre, welcome, and welcome back to New York. <laughs> Nice to have you here. So Andre is going to talk uh, maybe for uh, 40 minutes or so, and then I'm sure this is a subject that's going to be ripe um, for questioning. So he will undergo your examination afterwards. So thank you very much. I leave it to you. Thank you for such a gorgeous introduction. Yeah. Indeed, that's a uh, number of years uh, since I haven't been to New York. I uh, <coughs> came uh, here, actually, uh, when I immigrated here. New York was my <laughs> second motherland, so to speak. Anyway, um, uh, before I do my talk about Nicholas Rorich, I would like to ask some of you, do we have New Yorkers uh, here? In this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, have you been to Riverside uh, Drive? <laughs> Do you know what's located on the corner of Riverside Drive and uh, 103rd? Uh, yeah, what, what, is the, what is this? Do? Huh? Museum. Exactly right, exactly right. Until uh, 1960s, there was a Rorich Museum. Now it's in a different location, but that's the place. It's a, a quite a big building, skyscraper, okay? And if you, pardon? Master building, exactly, master building. And if you go to the very corner, you will see at the corner, uh, here it is. So this is the picture of this master building dated by 1929. That's when the building was erected, the uh, New York mayor participated in this. And they uh, laid at the foundation of this building, this uh, stone, 1929. And look at this, uh, look at the, uh, letter M, master, okay, master, who is this master? <laughs> Why is master building? Yeah, right now, if you go there, just take your time. Uh, New Yorkers, of course, you know, but those of you who uh, uh, tourists came to visit, uh, go there, take train <laughs> one, and <laughs> explore the building. Uh, what does it mean, M, letter M? Letter M stood for Master Moria, Moria. It's other world teacher of Nicholas Rory. Okay, so today uh, my talk is about this uh, Russian-American uh, who mo uh, moved to the United States in 1920, and we can call him Russian-American artist, and about his uh, quest for uh, Shambhala. And one thing I want to uh, draw attention, not many people know about, it's not only about his quest for uh, sacred Shambhal, it's about his attempt to fulfill this prophecy, 
That's what makes it interesting. So he was the one who tried to fulfill it. He wanted to, uh, based on the Shambhal prophecy, he wanted to build so-called the sacred union of the East, spiritual theocracy that would bring all Tibetan Buddhist people together. Quite bizarre, eh? But uh, <laughs> the point I'm trying <laughs> to make is that and I thought when I started doing this topic, when I uh, started gathering materials, uh, doc reading through documents, I uh, asked myself, what a nonsense. But then the more I explored, the more I realized there was something there. And I'm going to make an argument today that in fact, uh, it perfectly fit the context of the time, 1920s, 1930s, okay? And uh, we shouldn't forget also that Nicholas Rorich uh, called himself, always called himself a practical idealist. So, and now it struck me, that's the reason. So there's something there. So why and how we can call him uh, a practical idealist and why there was some uh, realism so, <laughs> behind this idealism. <clears throat> First, those of you who... Uh, from your responses, I uh, figured out that some of you know about Nicholas Rorich, but those of you who are not familiar with this name, it's uh, a Russian artist who is uh, famous for his uh, uh, <coughs> paintings that uh, depicted sacred uh, landscapes of the Orient, uh, Tibet, uh, uh, southern Tibet, Himalayan mountains, Mongolia, and southern Siberia, and some pagan uh, themes from Slavic folklore. Uh, his uh, uh, companion and soulmate, Helena Rorich, uh, she should uh, be given a appropriate credit. Uh, the lady who actually triggered the whole <laughs> quest for sacred shamble with her divine headaches she experienced uh, when she was a young girl, uh, had traumas and then she had visions and eventually she uh, <coughs> revisited the, these visions and came to conclusion that they were divine headaches because she started to experience this uh, visits from other world, the teacher, whom eventually uh, she called uh, Master Moria. And Rerich, uh, Nicholas Rory, her husband, later joined the game, so to speak. So he was a late arrival to this uh, uh, prophecy. <coughs> Uh, I want to stress that my book, which you can find in the uh, uh, book museum bookstore, it's not only about uh, Nicholas and Helena Rory. There are only two chapters about them. My book, it's uh, a story about uh, different characters, and many of them uh, were related to Russia. Uh, not necessarily to Russia. Some of them uh, were related to Tibet, some of them were Americans, like Henry Wallace, okay? But what is, um, uh, there is a common thread, a common theme among all these uh, characters. They uh, believed almost in a Gnostic manner that uh, they could find some absolute knowledge. And by using this absolute knowledge, they could build um, a spiritual or political paradise on this earth, okay? And uh, a Tibetan prophecy about Shambhala, which I heard uh, your know, guide, those of you who uh, heard the story of uh, Shambhala prophecy, uh, a fascinating job, so how he explained to you what stands behind this uh, prophecy. So the reason they wanted to use this prophecy, these outsiders, uh, Russians, Americans, uh, and some uh, indigenous Siberians who came to learn with, uh, uh, who came to, learn the Tibetan wisdom in uh, Tibet. They wanted to uh, promote their spiritual and political schemes by using this prophecy, okay? And the Rorich was one of them, one of these people. There are a few chapters. Why did I pick up uh, Rorich? Simply because, again, uh, we are here in New York, and uh, simply because Rorich, uh, a quest for Shambhala somehow was related to New York City and to this building, master building that uh, was erected in 1929. So that's the only uh, reason. <clears throat> All right, where shall we start? <clears throat> mm. Let me 
show you this brief uh, video, like uh, uh, an introduction, and you will uh, see it's like a three minutes. It's uh, uh, a trailer for one of the chapters of my book. So I found out it's uh, the best way to give my readers what uh, uh, the book is all about. I prepared, I uh, made it myself, a few uh, video clips. So uh, could we do this, please? <coughs> All right, so now, where did it come from, this idea, to go to Tibet and uh, to retrieve Shambhala prophet, so to speak, and to use it to uh, fulfill his geopolitical uh, utopia? Uh, today, I'm going to mention some of these sources. And again, uh, some of these names you uh, have heard from your uh, guide. I'm glad that uh, uh, tour guide that he alerted you about this. <coughs> Rorich was quite uh, uh, a celebrity in the 1920s, 1930s. He uh, was friends with uh, presidents, uh, senators, Congress people. <coughs> so a lot of people uh, knew him. Okay. These uh, are some of the samples of his art. Definitely he was steeped in uh, uh, Oriental spirituality. Okay. Uh, there are... Um, 
different opinions about him. For instance, uh, in Russia, uh, many Russians believe that he is a great Russian patriot, okay, who remained, uh, who remained friends with Russia to the very end. Some New Age people in Russia fascinated with his spirituality. They worship him like uh, some people uh, worship Carlos Castaneda in the 1960s here in the United States. Uh, one of the recent books says that he was a Soviet spy on the <laughs> paid spy. Uh, in the United States, he is also uh, known as a dangerous guru who seduced Henry Wallace, FDR vice president, because uh, Henry Wallace was part of his uh, esoteric circle. If you uh, don't know about read about this in uh, my book, a very interesting story, but I saved it. Decided not to tell about it. <laughs> read it on your own. Okay, now in 1923, something happens in Tibet that uh, uh, prompted Rorik to come from New York urgently to Tibet and to start his uh, uh, quest for Shambhala. What happened? Panchen Lama, the second in command in Tibet, escaped from uh, uh, Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama, 13th Dalai Lama, was angry with him because uh, Panchen Lama. Uh, refused to pay taxes. Uh, th does everybody know uh, who Panchen Lama is? Okay, no? Okay. Panchen Lama was, uh, 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 historically, he was considered a spiritual tutor of, uh, uh, Panchen Lamas were spiritual tutors of the Dalai Lamas. Okay. Because in early Middle Ages, uh, uh, that was the role of Panchen Lamas. So, uh, uh, in contrast to this stereotype, we have that Tibet was also dominated by Dalai Lamas. It's not exactly true. Okay. First, it was like a, a feudal kingdom, and Panchen Lama was a powerful uh, uh, landlord, lord, who had a lot of privileges. Okay. And one of the privileges was not to pay taxes to Lhasa. Okay. In the modern times, when uh, uh, 13th Dalai Lama decided to build up uh, Tibet as a modern state, he tried to uh, downgrade the independence of these uh, local monasteries. And of course, uh, uh, Panchen Lama was the first target. So he tried to force him to pay uh, taxes. Panchen Lama didn't want so to make a long story short. He escapes to Mongolia, 1923. Uh, historically, Panchen Lamas were considered uh, uh, holders of this uh, Shambhala prophecy because in the 18th century, one of the Panchen Lamas wrote a guidebook, how to reach Shambhala kingdom, okay? So here is the occult sign for Rory. And by this time, Rory, who intensively read Blavatsky, uh, Rory and his wife started to receive messages from the other world, from Master Moria, okay? So go to Tibet, go to Tibet, and one of the messages was uh, uh, very strange. Uh, Master Moria, the other world uh, teacher, told uh, Rorich through Helena that Rorich uh, was fifth Dalai Lama. He is reincarnated fifth Dalai Lama. And here is uh, Panchen Lama in 1923 who escaped. So for him it was a sign that I have to go there, okay? So he goes there and triggers uh, <coughs> certain things, and I will, I'm going to mention these uh, interesting things. Um, so, uh, Rory uh, makes uh, 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 Dalai Lama robe for himself, and his son, George, comes with him also <laughs> in the Lama robe. Okay? They go to Darjeeling, a northern uh, uh, Indian town, and uh, there in uh, 1923, he was uh, recognized by some Tibetan uh, monks, visiting Tibetan monks, as they reincarnated uh, uh, Dalai Lama. So, and of course, he used it uh, uh, to boost up his uh, credentials, okay? <clears throat> uh, and by the way, he purposely, in order to, he didn't simply sit uh, waiting to be discovered as the reincarnation of the fifth Dalai Lama. He actually settled in the house that was called the Dalai House in Darjeeling. It's the house where in 19, oh, 19, oh, eight, I think, forgot the exact date, when, uh, uh, Dalai Lama escaped from uh, Chinese, because the Chinese tried to knock down independence of Tibet at that time. So he was hiding in this area and living in this house. So uh, Rory stays in this house. So the story spreads around. <laughs> A strange person came in, <laughs> and the monks recognized him as the reincarnated fifth Dalai Lama. <clears throat> 
And here he uh, paints some paintings which uh, send the message that we are going through certain Armageddon. So the world is going to be plunged into a state of uh, war. And out of this war, a new world would come, a spiritual paradise. Okay. So here is the, eventually uh, an idea to build up this uh, Tibetan Buddhist state out of the uh, people who lived uh, in Inner Asia visited Rory and Helena, and they started to work to fulfill this idea. They called it the Great Plan. Okay? So here's the major things, what, how they viewed this uh, uh, sacred union of the East, like a big theocracy okay, uh, based on collectivism. It's not because Roy was fascinated with communism, no, because the whole time, 1920s, 1930s, was saturated with ideas of collectivism, plan. If you, I'm a historian, so believe me, you know. It's, uh, uh, everybody was dreaming about it, okay. Science, worship of science, okay. Evolution, genetic, uh, eugenics. Uh, so all these things, okay. <clears throat> So he blended all these ideas like any uh, 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 good uh, New Age uh, uh, person, seeker. He blended all these ideas and out, uh, mixed it with the theosophy. And out of this, we have this plan, sacred union of the East. Okay. Sources. Okay. It's not, it did not come uh, suddenly, although he claimed uh, that he and his wife received it from a master Moria, the other world teacher. But eventually there were some sources, and that's uh, uh, what I'm going to unfold for you today, sources. I'm going to show you where it came from. So he did intensive reading, he met certain people, and out of these uh, books, out of these people, uh, eventually this plan <coughs> originated. Okay, the first source, Aguan Darji, an interesting person, a tutor of uh, the 13th Dalai Lama, who was uh, working before 1917 to build this pan-Asian state, Tibetan Buddhist state, under uh, leadership of the Russian Tsar, Nicholas II. And by the way, after 1917, Agvan Darjeev approached Bolsheviks, Red Russians, and trying to sell them this idea. And originally, uh, early Bolsheviks accepted this plan. They started to work okay, on this. Uh, Rory met him, he knew him, how? In 1909, they worked together on um, uh, Kalachakra, uh, Buddhist Kalachakra temple in St. Petersburg, which was blessed by Russian Tsar Nicholas II, okay? And your guide, by the way, mentioned, okay, this uh, uh, interesting Buddhist temple that was blessed by, Rus by the Russian Tsar, okay? And, uh, Agvan Darjeev exposed him to Shambhal prophecy. Um, I realized by <laughs> being one, with one of the groups, uh, going through the halls, I realized that I don't need to tell you uh, too much about uh, Shambhal. The only thing what I want to mention, which I think, uh, again, your guy did a good job, but the only thing, please remember that in early Middle Ages, um, Shambhal as a prophecy originated as a spiritual resistance most probably spiritual resistance against Muslim invaders. India and the southern part of Himalayan uh, mountains was invaded by uh, Muslim armies. Okay? And eventually they dislodged Tibetan Buddhists uh, from there. So that's how, again, it's uh, <coughs> my argument that uh, prophecy was created as spiritual resistance against Malacca people. Okay? Shambhala prophecy calls these enemies of Buddhist faith against whom Rudra Chakra, Rudra Chakra and the king of Shambhal would fight. Uh, they called them, uh, Tibetan Buddhists called them Lekka people, or people of Mecca, okay? Me Mecca, Lekka, see, resonates. At the same time, enemies of the face in other texts, they are called Lala, okay? So also enemies. Uh, uh, Shambhal prophecy is part of uh, Kalachakra tradition. It's a teaching, okay? So Shambhala, it's like part of it. <clears throat> Second source was the theosophy, Madame Blavatsky. Everybody knows, heard at least about Madame Blavatsky. 
And all these words Rory constantly used, like uh, sixth race, that would soon come and replace this uh, humankind uh, uh, that obsessed with materialism. Like it came from Madame Blavatsky, this uh, spiritually charged sixth race. Great white brotherhood. It came from Madame Blavatsky. So R Rory also talked about this great white brotherhood that uh, brotherhood of people that control the evolution of the world. And uh, he argued that occasionally great white brotherhood sent the messengers in the world to fulfill the prophecy. And he considered himself and his wife uh, messengers of this great white brotherhood. Okay. So Master Moria, an agent of this uh, great white brotherhood who controlled their life. And in fact, I was really... Uh, Shocked, uh, one of the uh, Helena Rory books recently was published. It, could be found, it can be found on internet. It's called High Path, okay? It's her spiritual diaries. Basically, the entire life was controlled by these otherworldly forces. They believed that the voice that was speaking from Great White Brotherhood gave them advice, okay? And they uh, worked to fulfill these prophecies. That's what they believed. <clears throat> Uh, the third source, which you never heard where it came from, this uh, idea to build up uh, the sacred union of the uh, East. It's Siberian autonomous, a Siberian autonomous movement. It's a group of people, ethnographers, folklorists, scholars, writers, who are obsessed uh, with out of Asia theory. So they tried to boost the uh, place of Siberian Russian Empire. And of course, like all provincial people, they try to say, we are great, we have the most ancient culture. So eventually, uh, to some extent, that uh, uh, these people, autonomous, they preceded the present day, uh, I would say, uh, multicultural <laughs> historians, yeah, who say that uh, Mongols were spiritual heroes, okay, creators of civilization. Again, I don't deny this, but uh, they were the first, and the source of this uh, philosophy was their... Uh, provincialism, because they wanted to raise, to boost the uh, place of Siberia within the Russian Empire. And uh, they talked a lot about Mongols, southern Siberia. Okay. Mongolia was also imagined part, as part of Siberia. Okay. They were not interested in Russian cultures, they were interested in indigenous cultures, because uh, they were the most ancient. Okay. They could build up this cultural legacy. So Patanin the, was the leader. And Rorich read uh, his books. And in this master building, which is on Riverside, where his school was located, again, he designed this building on the Riverside as the spiritual future, spiritual beacon for the humankind. And there he set up a master school. And uh, books of these Siberian autonomists were included in the curriculum of this school. So very important. In fact, he uh, brought one of them, see, the guy with the name which is hard to pronounce, yeah, Grebenshikov, George Grebenshikov. He brought this emigre writer from Paris, one of Siberian autonomists, uh, to advise him here in New York how to proceed, okay. <clears throat> and he gave him esoteric name, Turukan. Turukan. It means Tarlik Khan one of the ancient uh, uh, Mongol princes. In fact, in the Rorik circle, this uh, uh, secret circle, everybody had esoteric names, okay? He himself uh, uh, called himself Puyama. Uh, Helena Rorik was Uruswari, okay? George uh, carried the uh, name of a Mongol prince, uh, Nuru Khan, okay? And only Henry Wallace, <laughs> vice president, who joined this esoteric circle. He had a non-oriental name. He was called Galahad, the Sir Galahad, <laughs> on the quest for Holy uh, 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 Grail. <clears throat> and another source, it's uh, a novel <laughs> of his friend, Peter Krasnov, white army general, who wrote a book, uh, Beyond the Sistle, 1922. And the plot of this book is uh, a very simple. A Russian a painter goes to... Red Rush after the revolution to check things out. And his name of this uh, painter is Konstantin, which was the second name, uh, patronymic of Nicholas Rorik. And the conclusion of this novel, uh, I briefly summarize it, is that salvation of Russia uh, would come from Tibet. So they were friends, and obviously he picked up some 
ideas from this uh, uh, general slash writer. Uh, this part, I'm sure everybody heard, Asendovsky. You heard about Asendovsky, Ferdinand Asendovsky, his famous book, People, uh, Gods and Beasts, 1922. This book was uh, immensely popular at that time in 1920s. Twelve editions were published. It's almost like uh, Da Vinci Code today. Very popular. It's a story about uh, bloody white baron, this renegade white army general who hijacks briefly Mongolia and also wants to build up this huge Buddhist empire in, in Asia. Rory read this book, was fascinated with this book.